Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. And I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, what we learned in the markets this week video. Remember, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that's helpful to your understanding of the markets from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. So let's talk about the four things we learned in the markets this week. And point number one was U.S. stocks posted a positive gain on Friday, and it capped off not only a positive Friday, but a pretty impressive week with every major index that we track up 2% or better. Of course, there will be two days next week to cap off the month of January, but this month looks to be pretty impressive, bringing those indexes much higher for the month after the seventh worst year ever for the markets in 2022 and the third worst year ever for the stock and bond investor combined, the diversified portfolio. On Friday, we learned that personal consumption expenditures, which is important because that is one of the Fed's preferred gauges for inflation, is continuing to come down, leading to the assumption that the Fed will remain on target to raise interest rates by a quarter percent at their February meeting, which starts this Tuesday and ends February 1st, so just a two-day meeting. And that's certainly something to watch for this week, but a quarter percent increase would be a lot better than what we saw all of last year. And it's supposed to be only one of two. In addition, we saw a slew of corporate earnings reporting this week. Of note, Intel, which is important because it's building a large chip plant outside of Columbus, Ohio. They saw their stock, excuse me, sink on Friday, thanks to larger than expected quarterly losses. Have any kids in your life? Hasbro reported, and they're the toy and games maker. They fell after they reported lower than expected top line revenue, along with some layoffs. And American Express, they are the arch enemy of our friend Dave Ramsey. So thus, the enemy of my friend is my enemy. They're our enemy. They rose 11% on Friday after it announced plans to boost its quarterly dividend. On your screen, you can see the performance of those three stocks year to date versus the S&P 500. And of course, one of our favorite strategies, the moat strategy. For this week, the S&P 500, which is the benchmark when you combine growth and growth and income stocks together, was up 2.47. The Russell 2000, which tracks our more aggressive growth, smaller companies, that was up 2.45% for the week. And the NASDAQ, which is the proxy for our growth stocks in our Dave Ramsey vernacular, that had the best week of everybody striking a positive 4.32% for the week. Now, point number two, gold and silver have had strong rallies recently. Don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating for investments in gold or silver. Both have been awful investments during the last 10 years, but their price movements can be instructive on how the precious metals markets feel about our economy. Over the last 100 days, silver is up about 28%, and over that same time period, gold is up about 12%. Now that means the relative performance of silver over gold is about 16%. This is unique and this is important because on average, gold and silver show similar 100-day trailing differentials, meaning they're usually within 0.2% of each other in terms of performance. Because the amount is statistically unusual, it's a lot larger, we can glean that the precious metals market is telling us that they are bullish on global growth. Now, why would I say that? Or how would I come to that assumption? Silver is primarily an industrial metal. Therefore, if the price is spiking, it's because demand is spiking for those industrial uses. Gold, on the other hand, is used as an investment. Eh, and it's used for jewelry, for your wife, maybe. Uh, maybe, maybe you get her something a little better than that. The movements in these two price points support the idea that the economy globally not just here in the U.S., is in better shape than most of us thought it was going to be before we started this year. Of course, China's reopening has been a central theme of the market's success. And so that's also a lot of the driver of why there may be a lot more industrial demand for things like silver right now. Now, before I move on, I need to note, we do not and will not advocate for investment in precious metals. They trade primarily on a supply demand metric, not on the fundamental growth of a company like an organization or a stock does. With a stock, you're buying a stream of cash flows now and in the future from companies that are expected to make a profit. With gold and silver, you're hoping that Sean Hannity keeps pitching this stuff on his show. And remember, I love Sean Hannity. I'm not, it's not a dig at him. I'm just saying who pays his bills, the gold companies. 
Point number three, who remembers last year when my guy, financial advisor, Jake Buckwalter, got a shout out on the Dave Ramsey show? I certainly remember that. Maybe it was a highlight of my professional year last year was hearing Jake's name on that show. The question that was answered from Dave was why international was still a part of the Ramsey Solutions for categories, giving its recent underperformance. And the answer, of course, was you can't make assumptions about long-term returns based on short-term. And 10 years is relatively a short-term time frame in the scope of the history of the market. But you can't make decisions based on short-term time frames. Well, this year, non-U.S. stocks have outperformed U.S. stocks. You can see from the chart on your screen the performance of some of the international funds that we track versus the S&P 500. Now, in our opinion, one rationale for the outperformance this year for international stocks has been mentioned above, which is China's reopening, boosting hopes of stronger growth in places like Asia and Europe, hence the companies over there and the stock markets over there. Over the last 10 years, there have been few times that international investments have outperformed their U.S. counterparts. In 2009, we actually saw this uh, when what we call the EFA stocks, and EFA just basically means the stock markets in Europe, Asia, and the Far East that are from developed companies or countries and economies and stock markets across the world. That year, 2009, they outperformed U.S. stocks. Then again, they did it in early 2011. We saw some outperformance. That may have even stayed and, and held had it not been for the Greek debt crisis that became an issue over that period of time. And then there was 2017 and early 2018 when the world was looking at synchronized global growth during the first year of President Trump presidency after many years of sluggish growth before he was in the White House. During that time period, we saw IFA outperform U.S. stocks by over 4% in 2017, early 2018. Over the last 252 trading days, we have seen U.S. stocks post one of their largest outperformance numbers over international in a long time. So it may just be time for a little bit of a snapback of the international markets when they've underperformed for so long so much. Let's see if that holds true. But one thing's for certain, we'll hold true to our 25% allocation. Now, if you don't invest with us, one of the things we, we tell you to check is check your international fund. Many of our competition, especially in the Dave Ramsey world, the Smart Investor Pros, like to make you think you're investing in, the, in an international fund by picking you a world fund. World meaning world has U.S. in it. International does not. So half their stocks could be in U.S. stocks. If you hold a world fund, you probably only have a true allocation to international stocks of about 12.5% because your 25 is half U.S. And that has hurt you this year and may hurt you in the future. So make sure your Smart Investor Pro really has the heart of a teacher and is not just selling you on performance since the U.S. market has been better over the last 10 years. But that's not true that it will be positive over the next 10 years. We just don't know. And finally, let's talk about the 4% rule. Now, the 4% rule was created to state that if you just took out 4% of your portfolio each year and adjusted that withdrawal for inflation, you should never run out of money if you're properly diversified half into stocks and half into bonds. This chart that you're seeing on your screen was from another fee-based fiduciary financial planner named Andy Pachico. And we appreciate, Andy, you doing this because it shows someone that did 50% in the S&P 500 and 50% in the U.S. Barclays Ag, an index for bonds or your, your safer investments. And essentially what we're doing here is he was trying to dismiss the notion that a lot of these whole life insurance and index annuity scumbag agents are throwing all over social media and YouTube and different sources that you, an investor, are stupid for investing in the markets because you only earn 4% and you're still subject to the whims of the market. Now, let's be clear. The 4% rule isn't saying that all you're earning is 4%. Rather, it's saying you're probably earning something in the range of 7 to 8% and you need to leave something in there for inflation protection, hence the 2 to 3% being left in for inflation protection, leaving you with roughly 4%. And the fact that you're investing half the money in safer investments to limit your downside is why your returns are not coming in that 10 to 12% range. You've seen the S&P 500 return over the last 10 years, or if you go back longer over the last 30 years. Now, now my friend at this other firm, 
he stated, started this analysis at the worst possible recent time period, which was 1999, when the markets were getting ready to go through some really tough years. The portfolio started taking out 4%. You see that for $40,000. And the market dropped it down 2001, 2002 to nearly 820000 It nearly made all that back by 2007, even accounting for the distributions. And that's when then 2008 took it all away. 2008 comes around, it drops it down to 760,000. Now, that was tough, but you saw a nice rebound over the next 10 years until last year where this person was dropped down back down to 900,000. Now, 22 years of distribution, he's at 900,000. The key is this person had a plan, they stuck to it. Now, partly because it's hypothetical and there's no emotion involved in this. And today they have roughly what they started with for their heirs or their charities and They've had distributions that enabled them to live on with their social security. Now, past performance is not indicative of future returns and your situation will determine your investment recommendations. However, you do see that having a plan and sticking to it is a tried and true way to grow, build, and preserve your wealth. Thank you again to my LinkedIn friend, Andy Paco, for creating this chart. And remember, an index is an unmanaged basket of securities which you cannot invest in directly, only things that try to mimic those indexes such as the S&P 500. I think, I think I've covered all the disclaimers our compliance department wanted me to cover with this hypothetical example. But what you can see here is versus a whole life insurance product or an indexed annuity or all these things that again, should I be nice or mean, these scumbag agents out there, one of our local markets, including a few of our employees, got an invitation to a nice steak dinner. Why are they getting invited to a nice steak dinner? So that agent can sell them an index annuity because in the invitation, they say, our clients have had no market losses. Oh, that sounds good after a bad market year. The reality is, again, the tried and true way to grow your wealth is to invest in companies that have a demonstrated ability to grow their earnings, to grow their cash flow over time so that you can be a part of that as an owner in those companies. Now, the stock market is not a free lunch. It's variable. It goes up and down and there's no guarantee of a return. But that's why you do it the Dave way. You spread yourself out to lots of different companies through the four different categories, and you're not making any single bets on any specific company. You're betting on the U.S. economy. And as long as you're invested internationally correctly, as we just talked about, you're investing in the world economy. Now, again, don't let these smart investor pros that aren't very good sucker you into a world fund where basically you are putting all your chips on the U.S. stock market. That's not a smart play. Dave doesn't want you to do that. Dave wants you to put 25% internationally. So let's do it the right way with a smart investor pro that has the heart of a teacher, which is exactly what we do at Whitaker Myers. So if you would like to talk to one of the advisors at our firm at Whitaker Myers, you can go to the comment section of this video where we posted a link to the scheduling software. where You can schedule a meeting with any of the advisors on our team, or you can also schedule a meeting with one of our financial coaches. If you're not ready to start saving and investing for retirement. Our financial coaches are more than happy to walk alongside you if you're in baby step one or two, help you build a budget, help you get a plan to pay out of debt, and most importantly, be that accountability partner. Our coaches will tell you, we all know what it takes to lose weight, yet we all still go, or many of us still go to a gym or still go to a coach on the, on the uh, exercise side. Why? Because we want that accountability. We want someone to make sure that we're not eating the bonbons that we're working out, we're running, we're, we're being athletic in the things that we should be doing. So we're happy to do that for you. And would you do us a favor? If you like this video or you appreciate the content we're creating to help push the Dave Ramsey and Ramsey Solutions message out to more people, then would you subscribe to our page and hit the like button? Those two things help us with YouTube and Google's algorithm so our content gets pushed to more people. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.